Right below that is a little hidden, hidden feature of the Keshul, which is the snake game. Uh, some people don't know this is in here, so you can actually sit here and play the snake game, <laughs> which is pretty funny. So if you don't want to listen to the rest of this Kestrel class and you want to just kind of mess, be in your own little world and play the snake game, go ahead, go for it. As you can tell, this is a very long video, so if there's something specific you're looking for, use little chapter marks across the bottom or the spots in the description that'll skip you ahead to whatever it is you're looking for. Now, before we dive into the masterclass portion of the video, I wanna give a really short intro into Kestrels and why I like them and what I like about them. Full transparency, I am now part of Kestrels content team or whatever they wanna call it. Essentially, all it means is that I get access to new products so that I can do more videos for you guys, educational videos, show you some of the features. So if it's something you're interested in, you can see it ahead of time without having to purchase it and decide, is this really what you need? Is it really what you want? So that's really all that means. I don't get paid by them. I'm not paid to say any of this. There is no, hey, you know, you should go buy this thing. And as I was making this video, I felt like it was gonna feel like a sales pitch. So rather than me just telling you all the things that I like, I felt like it'd be really cool to put this together with the masterclass coming from Larry at Ridgeline, where he goes through everything the Kestrel does and a, a large part of how to use a lot of it. So that way you guys can see how feature packed this little tool actually is. So it is a great tool to have in your tool bag. It does a lot of things. Yes, you can do them manually, you can do them other ways, but this simplifies a lot of it and it does a lot of things for you that otherwise would be a little bit more complicated. So really quick, why I like the Kestrel is obviously as I've been getting into scope carving and more long range stuff, being able to have good data is really important, especially at matches. Now you can use the AB app, which is free. You know, if, you if, you, if you're just getting started and you're mainly just out plinking with your buddies and you're not going to a lot of matches, you're not shooting a lot of different places, that's perfectly fine. There's really no need to upgrade from that. However, if you're a hunter, if you're somebody who competes a lot, if you're getting more serious about this and start, starting to shoot further and further and smaller targets, then having good data is really important and having up-to-date weather is really important as well because as I learned when I was up at Ridgeline, what the weather is doing where you're shooting versus where what it's doing at the nearest airport can be very, very different. In a place where the weather changes very quickly and storms can move in or out, the, the temperature can go up or down, it changes very fast. So somewhere like that, having real-time uh, weather and real-time ballistics with where you're at, uh, this is super helpful for that. The other thing is I don't really like carrying my phone around at matches. I don't like having in and out. I always forget to charge my phone. I really don't use my phone for anything but mainly texting and calls. Because I, you know, as a photographer, I don't really use the camera. I don't really use a lot of the other stuff. So I just really don't like using the app and depending on it. And you guys know most of the ranges we shoot at don't have great cell service. And so having to deal with, is it going to work or is it not, is really frustrating. And I never have to depend on that with this. So that's another reason I like the Kestrel. It's, I prefer it. I can save all my my guns in there. So any any gun profiles I build out, I can put them in there. I can swipe through any of them. So as I change a gun or uh, like we did at the... Uh, last quantified performance match, Taylor on his Kestrel actually built out a profile for Recky Randy and got him all the data he needed so he could shoot the match. He ended up doing really well. And that was super, super easy to do. Uh, again, you could do something like that in the AB app, but then you have to pay for it and all, you know, whatever. Anyways, um, that's why I like the Kestrel. Now, the big downside is that it is pricey. So you have like the base model, you have the middle of the road model, and then you have the new X model. The X model is kind of the way to go for everybody if you're looking to get into one now, I think because it, it kind of future proofs with some of the new software that's coming out and then being able to connect to other things like SIG binos, like the ones I've been using, which I'll do a video on later, uh, connecting with range finders and all that, connecting with their HUD, it just speeds up the process. It allows you to do more things faster and not wait for that delay for it to kind of process. If you're not gonna plan on using any of those things, the middle of the road 5700 Elite is still a fantastic Kestrel. That's the one that I actually had before I got the new X model. But yeah, I would say that's the way to go. It is pricey, so it is something you will have to save up for, but I think it's a worthwhile investment. And again, rather than me sitting here trying to tell you all the things I love about it, I'm gonna turn it over to Larry from Ridgeline Defense, who's gonna give a quick masterclass, I say quick, a masterclass on Kestrels and then all the features that they have. You guys can decide for yourself if this is something you're interested in, something you wanna get, and then I'll chime back in at the end. So kind of just like basic buttonology on this thing. Uh, so on the back takes one AA battery. Uh, lithiums run 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 the best, uh, kind of have the best battery life in them. So if you look on the back, right on the back, right above the battery cap, right there, there's those two little holes that has a little symbol to not stick a paperclip in there. So don't stick a paperclip in there. Um, these are these are 
uh, two little sensors that help that gather you know the, the environmental data as well as that blue little little coil thing that almost looks like the end of the uh, end of a Q-tip that's right on the top right there uh, that does uh, the same thing. Obviously, you have your your kind of wind meter right here. If you open and close that, these can actually pop out. You can just take the whole thing out and replace them if they get dirty, if they get they get gunked up, stuff like that. Um, so kind of buttonology on the front of it, this bottom left uh, button, that's your on and off button. Um, uh, top left that with that little gear, that will take you to your settings menu, but also if you're kind of clicking through the, through the menus on there, that also acts as your back button. So throughout this class, whenever, if I say like back out of this or go back a screen, you just hit that button and that's, that's really what that does. Right next to that with that little, little red dash there, that's your capture button. I'll explain what that does in a little bit. Uh, and to the right of that is your backlight button. It also has uh, kind of another little feature that I'll explain to you guys. Obviously up, down, left, right, and, and, and center. So when you turn it on here, um, it'll come up. So say Kestrel 5700, it says, um, as I'll do it here, so it has, has your version, which is your software update, and then your battery. Sometimes the battery life uh, indicator isn't always 100% what it is. Um, and then when you turn it on, most of the times it'll take you right to your to your ballistic screen. Or if you're on the weather screen, it'll it'll take you to that whenever you turn it on. Um, so this this right here, uh, as you guys can see, um, this is kind of the main ballistic screen right here. So let's go ahead and click that little gear button, and it'll take you into the settings. Right at the top, it'll say mode. You can you can switch between ballistics, easy, or weather. The 5700X took the easy mode out of it. Uh, easy mode kind of limits you to some base, um, kind of large, large features. Uh, it takes kind of some of some of the um, more detailed stuff out. Um, that makes it a little simple. Um, but we always want to stay on ballistics mode to get all all the information that 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 you would want to get. Um, so right below that, you have Bluetooth. If you click on Bluetooth, you can uh, uh, it'll go to connect. You can select between device or PC or mobile. Um, Device is for if you're using, you're linking it to like a Raptor or the Kestrel HUD or kind of anything like that. And then obviously the other one, uh, so you can actually link this to your phone. Uh, if you go and you download the Kestrel Link app, it's on the app store, it's free. Um, it makes it makes it pretty easy to, to build guns. You can access the full bullet library from Fly Ballistics um, in there, which is great. Um, so you can get all those custom drag models and everything like that. So this is where you can turn your Bluetooth on and off. Uh, so if you turn it on, um, you go down, you can set a privacy pin to it, which is honestly a pretty convenient thing, especially if you're going for, to matches and everything, and everybody's got their Kestrels out, and everybody's trying to connect to their Kestrels, uh, and whenever you pull up your Bluetooth, it'll pull up the serial number that's right here on the, on the, on the back of the Kestrel on the top left, um, and that's, that's the one that you'll click, and if you don't have uh, a, a, a privacy pin set on there, then somebody else could connect to your Kestrel in the middle of a match, wipe all your guns, put their gun in there, you see what I'm saying? That it could be a bad, bad day. Um, so privacy pin is, is typically a pretty good thing. Data port, you can turn that on and off. These two little holes on the back right here, uh, that's where you'd clip in and plug into a computer. You can, you can do updates uh, through Bluetooth uh, with your phone, or you can connect it to the computer. And sometimes it goes a little bit faster, depending on how good your Wi-Fi is and stuff like that. Uh, so right below that, you got memory options. Uh, so this will tell you how many, how much memory is used. You know all the store rate, overwrite, clear, and then you can clear it out. Um, not too, not too complicated. Right below that, you got graph scale. <clears throat> so this has all, uh, kind of all of your different readings um, in wind speed, temperature, humidity, pressure, altitude, and density altitude. So you can go into here, like wind speed, and it'll say you can set the high. At you, I only want the Kestrel to read up to this speed, and I only want it to read down to this speed. I typically just leave it on the factory settings. Um, you never, never really have to go too far out of there. Same, same goes with all the rest of the, uh, the stuff on there. So you back out of that, uh, go down below, below that, you have display. So you have auto shutdown, um, depending on how long you want for, with you not touching this, just till it turns off, that's all that is. In time, contrast, pretty much just leave it on 10. Haven't had any issue with that. Backlight, as you guys, as you guys can see up, up there, uh, my backlight's on white right now, but you can also turn it to red. You can't really see it on here, but it, it's kind of like uh, light discipline stuff. It'll, it'll make that backlight red, so if you're outside in the nighttime, it's not a big flashlight shining right in your face, uh, which is convenient for, for kind of tactical application. Uh, so if you back out of that, 
Uh, right below display, you have system. Uh, system, you can set the time and date. You can calibrate the compass here. So when, I'm, when I get into compass calibration, uh, when you click enter, it'll say hold Kestrel upright, rotate slowly for 30 seconds. And then you'll have to hit enter again before you do that. And it'll count down from 30 seconds. I'll go ahead and do it here. You'll say spin in the same direction until complete. When you spin in the same direction, you spin the Kestrel like this. I've taught this class before, and then people are like turning their whole bodies around, <laughs> spinning their whole bodies in, in a circle, which that's, that's not what you do. Um, make sure when you do that, you're not inside or any uh, near, kind of right next to any other, any, anything that could skew you know, a compass. Uh, right below that, you have accuracy first. If it's, if it's off in your Kestrel right now, or if you don't see it, you don't have the newest update. Um, I forget what update they put this in, but there's some pretty neat little features uh, in that stuff. So right here is where you go ahead and turn it on. Uh, right below that, you have measurements. Uh, so this is for your weather screen. Um, these are, uh, if you go back up to the top of this whole thing, which we won't do right now, I'll go into that uh, just after we get through all the settings. Um, this is where you have a whole bunch of different screens that you can turn on and off to see whatever, whatever uh, kind of data you want to see uh, throughout weather. So you have time and date, direction, wind speed, crosswind, headwind, temperature, wind chill, humidity, heat index, dew point, wet bulb, pressure, barometric pressure, altitude, density altitude, and then you can set some custom user screens, which, are, which is pretty neat, where you could have a, uh, a few of those kind of on one, scre on one screen. Excuse me. Um, so if you back out of that, right below that, you have units uh, right there. You can, set, um, you can set your units, your global units in between imperial and metric. Right below that, wind speed, you can change it to miles an hour, to feet per second, meters per second, kilometers an hour, uh, knots. So you can just leave that on miles an hour because that's how we, how we measure our wind, right? Uh, temperature, leave it in Fahrenheit. Pressure, INHG is inches of mercury. Uh, leave it on that. Altitude, keep it in feet. Um, right below that, you can change the language uh, for the whole Kestrel if you need to. Right below that, you have battery. Uh, so this is, if you're not using a lithium battery and you put an alkaline battery or something like that, you go into this setting in the battery and you select what battery type you have so it knows how much power to draw versus uh, the battery that it has in there. Uh, it'll also tell you your battery life uh, in there. As you can see, it's kind of jumping all around um, there. Uh, back out of that, right below that, humidity calibration, and then you can factory reset everything right there. Uh, below system is about. Uh, this is, if you, if you click on about and you go into version, this will tell you under uh, FW, your firmware, that'll tell you what update you have on your Kestrel. Uh, I'm pretty sure at this time 1.51 1, 1 is, is the newest update, uh, but they, they come out every so often. Uh, most of the time, as soon as you link your Kestrel to your phone, uh, through the link app, um, then as soon as as soon as you kind of link the two, uh, it'll pop up and say, "There's a new update. Do you want to update it or no?" And so you just do that. Um, so if you back out of that, right below that, you have legal, uh, and you can look at all the patents, copyrights, and all that stuff. Right below that is a little hidden hidden feature of the Keshul, which is the snake game. Uh, some people don't know this is in here, so you can actually sit here and play the snake game. <laughs> which is pretty funny. So if you don't want to listen to the rest of this Kestrel class and you want to just kind of mess, be in your own little world and play the snake game, go ahead, go for it. Um, so that's really it for kind of the settings menu. So let's go all the way back up to the top, uh, how right here it has highlighted ballistics. If you scroll to the right, uh, let's skip over easy. I'm not going to get into that stuff. Because um, it, it, it doesn't have as much information as you can get in the ballistic screen. Uh, flip over to weather and click enter. Uh, and this will bring you to a series of, of screens here. As you can see, mine was previously on wind speed and miles an hour. Um, if you scroll to the right or to the left, it can bring you to, between these different screens. It will show you the min, average, and max that, that you've read. Um, this is, this is the, the majority of the screen. Uh, this is the main screen that I really ever use in... in um, in weather, although the other ones are super, super convenient uh, um, if, you ever, if you ever want to know that data. So if you scroll down, this is, again, all those settings that I said, you can turn these screens on and off. So as you scroll down, you can, you can, you can scroll through all, the, all those different screens there um, and go through and, and get all this, all this data right here. Um, 
again, like I said, the wind speed miles an hour is what, the one that I use the most. So here's, here's your first little hack of the Kestrel. Uh, this backlight button, how you can turn the backlight on and off. Uh, so the main screens, obviously there's weather and there's ballistics, right? If you double tap this, this uh, light bulb fast, look what it does. It brings you right from weather to ballistics fast. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a quick little hack. Instead of having to go in the settings, flip over, enter into it, you can just double, tap, double tap that fast um, and do that. Okay, so now we're into ballistics, which is kind of the meat and, meat and the potatoes of, of uh, what the Kestrel does here. Um, so as you can see, uh, the, 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 uh, the screen's kind of split into two, right? So at the very top, you have E, which is your elevation, uh, and then whatever, whatever your elevation is for the target you have inputted. Um, on the top right, you have either an alpha or a one, uh, depending on what, what uh, numerical thing, whichever target you have on at that time. I'll get into that in a second. Right below that, you have W and then a number slash another number. That's, that's your wind speed one and your wind speed two. So you can input two different wind speeds into here um, to kind of have more data for each target. Um, that you go to. Uh, so if you look highlighted right now, it's highlighted over TGT, which is your target, and then it has an azimuth number, and then to the right of that is um, uh, a yardage or a distance, right? So right here, as, I'm, as I am right here, if I go scroll to the right, no, oh, actually this one I have another target on. So if I click enter on target uh, and scroll up to the top and highlight over target, Everybody follow me? Click enter on that. Uh, this is where you can uh, designate on how many targets you want active at a time. Uh, you can also select the designator if you want it to be in uh, numerical or alphabetical, either one. Um, so with that, uh, as you can see here, I have multiple targets on. So if I'm in this main ballistic screen, if I scroll to the right or to the left, it brings me, you can see this number in the top right, it'll bring me to the, the, the following targets that I have turned on. So you can set multiple different targets in here and you can flip through them fast. If you don't want to have multiple targets set in here, let me go ahead and turn this one off. Now, when I'm on this main ballistic screen, you see this one and I scroll left or right, it doesn't scroll between targets, it just ups the distance or downs the distance each click by one meter or yard, whichever one you have it set on. Um, so uh, that's kind of how you can turn those different targets on. You can turn up to 10 targets uh, on at once in this, in this main screen. Um, there's a target card that I'll get into a little bit later. Uh, so if you go ahead and click enter on target, uh, you have target range. Um, again, you can scroll left or right. Um, and this is how you would set the specific target range for each target if you have multiple targets on. So you'd have to click on each one and go in there and set the distance. And then when you back out to the main screen, when you go left or right, like I said, it'll flip between full targets, not just the range, up or down, up or down one. Uh, so right below that, you have your direction of fire. Uh, in degrees, if you click on that, you can capture it. So with uh, capturing, you, you have to have your compass calibrated, obviously, or else it wouldn't know actually which, which way you're facing. Whenever you capture your direction of fire, the, the back of the Kestrel is kind of like what you're aiming at your target. So hold your Kestrel up in the direction that you're, that you're aiming your target. Some people think it's kind of, you're pointing it like this. That's, that's not the way that it is. You hold the Kestrel right up, uh, straight up and down vertically and do all that stuff. Again, right below capture, since you have to have your compass calibrated to, to capture it, it has another little uh, kind of cheat screen to, to, comp to um, calibrate your compass right there. Uh, so if you back out of this, again, if you scroll left or right, you can manually in input um, a direction of fire. Uh, so before I get too far down below that, if you back out to the main screen, like I said, there's that azimuth that's right um, in between t TGT, which is your target, and the range there. So when you're on this, you can click this capture button. That's what that, uh, that's what that, red, um, that red button is here. And so you, if we click that, again, like you can kind of see here, depending on which way I aim it. Now it's actively capturing the direction of fire, right? Whenever you click it again, it's gonna take in that last direction of fire that it was faced towards, and it's gonna save it in for that target. Um, uh, so that's kind of uh, an easy way to go ahead and capture that stuff. So if you click on target again, 
so we have our range, we have our direction of fire, keep scrolling down from that. You have eye dag, which is your in inclination degree. Uh, if you're looking, you know, shooting high angle, looking up, up the hill or downhill, uh, depending on what degree it is, you can mainly input it up or down, plus meaning you're looking uphill, minus meaning you're looking downhill. Uh, right below that has the eye cosine, and as you, as you see here, as I change the degrees, it auto-populates auto the cosine there for you. Um, one thing with that while we're on it, if I have an inclination set into this Kestrel and I back out and I go, once I set the inclination, it's going to apply um, all that math to my, to my actual data for, for whatever my holdovers are. But down below that, you have TS, which is your target speed. Uh, so this is for shooting movers, right? Um, so with target speed, obviously, say you get to a match, right? And you want to, you want to. Most matches you go to, they'll they'll tell you what the what the target speeds are if they have movers going and stages with movers on them. Um, but I also like to double check those 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 movement speeds because if if it's not what they says it is, obviously uh, my leads for those targets is going to be incorrect. So a neat little thing in this Kestrel here is if you click on target speed. Obviously, you can change the units between miles an hour and all that other stuff. Leave them on miles and not miles an hour. Right below that, you have estimate. So if you click estimate, it'll bring up all these different series of information here. So you get range, movement, time, and speed, right? So range, obviously, you're going to input the distance at what that, that mover is, right? Movement, this is, so what you're doing is you're going to measure in your reticle, spotting scope, whatever it is that can measure um, an angular unit to measure, uh, you're going to move, you're going to, um, this is for how the duration that you're going to uh, measure that target between. So the, the one that comes kind of standard on the Kestrel is 1.8 mils. Uh, I like to bump that up to really at least 10 for me. But again, just like any other kind of science experiment, the longer duration that you're going to measure that for, the better outcome or the more accurate reading you're going to get for the speed of that target, right? So I'll bump this up to 10. Uh, right below that is the time, so that's the time uh, that it took for the mover to cross. So if you're doing it in your, in your reticle, right, you can either start at 5 and end on 5 or start at your crosshairs and end on 10 mils over. Um, so as soon as that mover gets to your crosshairs, uh, this is kind of a neat little thing with time. If you click on time, it brings you to a stopwatch, right? So as soon as you do that, you're looking through your scope. You don't even have to look at your Kestrel. You're on the stopwatch. As soon as that thing crosses your crosshair, you're going to click start. And then when it gets to 10 mils, you're going cl to click stop, right? It's going to measure that time. When you back out, it's going to do that whole equation. It knows the distance of the target. It knows how long you were measuring it for. And now it knows how long it took to get between those two known points. Uh, and it's going to spit out a speed. And that's going to tell you. Uh, how fast the mover's going, which is it's, it's a pretty neat little handy thing uh, to check the actual actual movement of, uh, of targets. If you back out of that and you've measured something, um, it's going to ask you if you want to accept the estimate. Uh, this is where you can select yes or select no. If you select yes, it's going to apply that mover speed. Uh, so for, for the kind of the example that I just did there, if I click yes, let's see how it's applied that mover speed now um, uh, to that target. Um, right below that, you have wind direction. So everybody do me a favor here. Click the little gear button back out to the main ballistic screen. Right below target, you have wind, right? You have the direction uh, in clock directions, and then right to the right of that, you have the speed of the wind. So when you click on that, uh, if you click on wind there, and then just scroll up, you see what it does? It brings you right back into target. So when you scroll in target, if you go into target and you just keep scrolling down, it's just going to continue on into that wind screen, right? Uh, so wind direction, uh, if you click on that, you can change it between clock degrees, um, clocker degrees there. Uh, and this is the direction that the wind is coming from. It's not the direction that the wind is going. So for this 3 o'clock wind that I have inputted now, it means the wind's coming from, th from the 3 o'clock. Right below that, like I said here, this is where you can in input your wind speed 1 and wind speed 2. Um, so whenever you input those to whatever, you, whatever, you, whatever it is that day, some people do the average and the high, or some people do the low and high, however, however you want to do it. Um, that's where you'd input those, and then when you back out, that's where these two numbers would appear, right there. When you capture your wind using the capture button, yep. will it automatically populate that clock direction? It will. 
It will. So this is this is another the other feature of the capture button, right? So you can also capture your wind using this. Now, no, no, you're good. You're good. Yeah, yeah. Whenever you capture your wind, you before capturing your wind, you have to capture the direction of fire for that target that you're shooting at, right? So I capture my direction of fire that I'm th of the target that I'm shooting at. So now the Kestrel knows which way I'm shooting. So now when I, whenever I go to capture that wind, again, when I capture the wind, I face the back of the target, in, back to the Kestrel, into the wind, um, and then it's going to measure, measure that stuff. So if I go down here to wind and I click the capture button, now, depending on which way the wind is coming from, it's going to apply this wind direction in relation to the direction of fire that you have inputted already. So it knows which way that you're shooting, right? And then when you capture the wind, it's going to apply that direction of that that wind direction in relation to your direction of fire. Um, so when you do that, uh, whenever you capture wind, uh, sit there and you know hold it, let the wind cycle, let it gust, let it die down, do all that stuff. After you do that, like I said, it's going to it's going to input the wind direction, and then for your wind speed one, it's going to input uh, the average mile an hour of wind that it that it read throughout the duration of you capturing it. And for wind speed two, it's going to put the highest. Um, the highest wind speed that it recorded. Um, so like that, uh, that's, that's kind of what the, what the capture button can do. But make sure when you're doing that, like I said, reiterate it. Make sure, make sure, make sure you, do, you capture your direction of fire before you capture your wind. And it'll ultimately put those into your um, range card, right, for your dope. It'll tell you how yes. your wind holds. It'll use that. Yep, yeah, when you go down to your range card uh, and you scroll left and right, wind speed one and wind speed two are going to be what you have inputted in, into here. Uh, with the direction that the wind is coming from as well. All right, so right below that, uh, you have your gun, right? Uh, so this one, just like uh, when we went through kind of the ballistic calculator class uh, in ballistics yesterday, all the screens are pretty much the same of every, everything that we talked about yesterday. So in here, if you click on gun, if you scroll up to gun uh, and you click on it, uh, this is where you can name that gun. Um, obviously you just name it whatever you want. Uh, a quick little cheat for this that I found out a little while ago. Uh, whenever you go to a new profile, let me see if here, if I do new gun right here and I click on one, I go up to gun and it's user gun one is what it auto populates as that. I don't typically like to name my use user gun one, user gun two. I, I put whatever I want that gun to be called. Uh, instead of cycling through here till you find the blank space and clearing out the whole thing, this capture button, if you click the capture button, look what it does. It automatically erases each one one by one, so you can start from start from fresh right there, um, which is pretty cool. It, may, it just makes things a little bit faster. Um, all right, so right below that you have MV versus muzzle velocity. If you scroll left or right, it's going to bump your muzzle velocity up or down by one feet per second. If you click on muzzle velocity, it's going to bring you into um, uh, this screen where you can change the units between feet per second. Obviously, we only use feet per second, right? Uh, so right below that, you have Cal MV. Uh, so Cal MV uh, is when you're truing your gun, right? We 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 zero our gun. We get our we uh, we chronograph our gun. We input the the uh, <clears throat> the muzzle velocity that we got from the chronograph using the magneto speeds like we did yesterday. Um, and then when you put this in, that whole class that I gave on you know, supersonic, transonic, um, subsonic, that last 10% of, uh, of supersonic that we want to true in, uh, so it's going to spit out right here at, at the top in parentheses. That's going to be the ideal range that you want to true your gun. So it does all that math for you. And it says if you want to true your gun, this is the perfect place to do it. Go find a target there or go and place a target there. So for this gun that I have inputted here, it says 897 yards, right? So then right below that, uh, you have range, and so this is, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll input the actual distance to the range of the target that you're chewing at, because you know most of the times you go to the range, that distance that it spits out, you don't have, always have a target that's exactly at that range. So you're going to input the range there. Uh, right below that, you have your drop. Uh, so if I input my range here to what it says, or to whatever your target is, Uh, that's your drop. So that's, that's, that's where you're going to hold on that target, right? Same thing we talked about cheering yesterday. You're going to put that hold on the target at whatever distance you put into there. You're going to shoot a group, ideally. Uh, mean, mean point of that group 
Uh, it should, if you've done all your inputs correctly into here, it should line up perfectly. Like I said, if you get some major deviation whenever you go to true, the very first thing you should do is come into here uh, and check to make sure all your inputs are right uh, before you just go wildly changing your muzzle velocity. Um, since we've got it from an accurate, uh, an accurate chronograph like the magneto speeds are. So if you did have to make a change, right? Uh, so it's telling me to hold 8.43, say I needed 8.6. I'm gonna bump this up to 8.6. This is what you're putting in. I shoot the bullets in live time, and this is exactly where they're hitting. This is what I'm gonna put into there. And down below there, it's gonna show you the difference uh, the, in what it's gonna change your muzzle velocity to. Um, so whenever you do that, uh, if you hit the little back button, it's gonna say add new MV temp entry. Uh, so MV temp, uh, I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, for this, click no. Right, you're gonna hit back, so it's not gonna add a new temperature, saying that the, the temperature that I'm that, that it has in the environment uh, is what the temperature that my that my bullet and realistically my powder is right now, which that's not always correct. Most of the time, it's not correct, right? Um, so after that, it's gonna say new muzzle velocity is this. Accept it or reject it. If you accept it, just hit the center button, right? Uh, MV Cal guide. So there's there's right below that. This is kind of a this is kind of a, a cool little thing that the Kestrel has here. If you want, uh, there's kind of a, a couple things that you should do before you actually. This is kind of the Kestrel saying their way of like, did you check to make sure all the data that you've inputted in here is correct before you're just telling it to change the muzzle velocity to this, right? So this is kind of a neat little thing. So if you click MV Temp guide. It's going to say confirm approximate your latitude. So right now I have the latitude set at zero. It's telling you to check. It goes through a list and it says, did you check this? Did you check this? Did you check this? Did you check this? Kind of makes it dummy proof, right? Uh, so I'm going to put in the correct latitude. Then I'm going to hit continue. Capture environment. It's gonna, that's going to say, did, did you already capture the environment to make sure that you know all, what that that's correct in here? Uh, and if you didn't, then you can hit start capture. Uh, and do that. Um, again, you'll let it let it capture the environment. Hit end capture. Did you find a target between this yard and that yardage? And then you can change. This is where you can change your your yardage there. So this is kind of making sure that you put a target in the correct location and you're not bumping it into something weird. It's it's making sure you're true in the correct spot, right? Um, and then again, you can change the yardage to what to the target that you actually put there. Hit continue. Did you capture the direction of fire? See, it goes through this whole list. Uh, point back back of the unit at the target and the capture capture the direction of fire. It's going to almost force you to do that, right? Start capture. End after five seconds. End capture. It's going to say, did you put in the right wind? See all of these all of these different things. It's going to make sure that you didn't mess something up before you go and true your gun. Um, and then it's gonna then a it's gonna pop up populate here. Um, it's going to, kind of just a longer version of the previous. Uh, if you just click M, uh, Cal MV, right? This is where you can change your elevation if you actually need to, and it's gonna spit out your your muzzle velocity. And then uh, again, accept or reject. Um, so right below this, you have MV temp. So MV temp. Uh, is kind of a, in theory, it sounds like a really cool, really cool kind of feature here, right? And it, realistically, it is, if you have all the time in the world to perform these science experiments, to find out uh, your, the different muzzle velocities at different temperatures of those powders. Uh, so right here, you can put in a new entry. And so what you'd need to do to this is you'd have to get your cartridge, realistically, the powder inside of your cartridge to a certain temperature and know that temperature and then take it and go and put a, shoot it across the chronograph, and then make the ammo really hot at a hotter temperature, and know that temperature, and know the powder inside of your cartridge is at that temperature, and then go and chronograph, and then do it cold, and you put input all these different things, right? It's a lot of work, it is. Um, uh, but then when you do this, uh, based on what temperature, this is this is where it kind of gets a little a little sketchy for most people, right? Uh, whenever you do this. Say we go to the range and we're it's it's winter time here in New Hampshire, right? 
we're in the classroom, the heat's on, it's nice, it's 75 degrees in the classroom like it is right now. Everybody's hanging out in here, we have all our ammo and gear in here, and then we go out to the range and we go to zero and get data on our guns, and it's 10 degrees outside. When I go outside, my ammo that's been sitting in here that's 75 degrees, and I, and I go outside and gather, gather my environmentals and this says it's 10 degrees, it's gonna think that my ammo is at 10 degrees too. You can see that that could cause big problems there. So like, I wouldn't recommend using this uh, right now. Maybe if you, if you want to get more into the science and get, really get precise with all of your numbers, yeah, it's, it, I mean, it could be a cool thing, but it is, it is a lot of work. Um, right below there, MV temp slope. Um, some companies are starting to release this. So, so what this is, is real, realistically, it's a, uh, They'll say for every, uh, for every one degree temperature change, this is what the, temp what the velocity change is gonna be. And so it's kind of a, a graph scale um, on, on how, how it looks like that. So, uh, you know, most pretty kind of temperature stable powder nowadays, like they'll put out, hey, for every one degree, uh, it's gonna change a half a foot per second or one foot per second or something like that. So you can input this into here and then it'll, it'll create that slope. But again, it's, it's thinking um, that the, the ambient temp temperature that you have inputted to the environment is the same temperature that, that your powder's at. All right. So back out of that, back out of that, that uh, was a long time on muzzle velocity. Um, there's, there's, there's some, you can deep dive these things pretty, pretty easily. So right below that, you have your drag model. Uh, this is where you can switch between G1, G7, and custom. A lot of the Kestrels come preloaded with a, with a, uh, um, a few different um, kind of custom drag models for, for your, your, common, your common bullets, you know, 140 grain EODMs, 175 Sierra Match Kings, um, a, a, bunch of, a bunch of different other ones. There's, uh, normally there's a, a bunch of mill ammo into here, some 300 Norma, we'll get into some 50 cal. Uh, M855 Alpha 1, like it, it, sometimes it'll, it'll have a de decent amount of, of stuff in here. Um, so if you're shooting that bullet, then you don't have to link it to the app and you can scroll over and just select that bullet and then that's, uh, you'll have a custom drag curve that's already preloaded into there. Um, but this is where you'd switch between that G1 and G7. BC, obviously that's saying that. Again, if you're running a custom drag curve, your BC is gonna auto-populate to one because it's not comparing it to these other, these other scales, the G1 scale or the G7 scale. It's using its own data. It's comparing it to, to itself, right? All right, so right below that, uh, you have your bullet weight. Here, you have your bullet diameter. Uh, you have your zero range here. Um, so here's kind of one of the cool things about, about your uh, zero range. So if you click on zero range right here, uh, you'll see uh, you can switch the units between yards and meters right here. And again, when you switch the units here, uh, you can also do it under target. You know, when you click on your target, you can uh, click target again, and you can change between yards and meters. No matter what place you do it, when you switch it between yards and meters, it changes the whole Kestrel over to yards or over to meters, right? Uh, so right, what's that? So you can actually get different data. That yes, yeah, so it's not like the main screen is gonna have it in yards and then your, tar then your, your, your range card is gonna have it in meters. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be crazy, right? Um, so right below units, you have uh, max PBRs, your max point blank range. So this kind of works out. We were just talking about this today, right? Uh, so this is kind of a, a, neat little, a neat little calculator for this. So for this gun, uh, it's gonna, you, can, you can input a target size, right? So we were working them out on those 12 inch circles today for your max point blank size. And so you can change it down and you can actually just find out the data right here without having to go and shoot it like we, like we did today. So if I, if I bump this down to 12 inches, right? It's gonna take a second and it's gonna populate this stuff. So max point blank held, 1.2 mils. So that's gonna give you the most amount of room out to the furthest distance of you just holding 1.2 center on that target for a 12 inch target. That's what I input, it in, input into here, right? Um, so this, this shows you, uh, so max point blank held tells you what the ideal uh, hold for that gun, that amp, like everything, the gun that you have inputted into there. Um, is right below that your max point blank range. So this is the range at which it's gonna fall off of the bottom of the target. So for this gun, as soon as I get to 362 yards, I'm gonna miss off the bottom, right? Uh, No-go, 
this is if you mill the target. And so right here, uh, it has 0.92 mils. So if I mill that 12 inch target and it's any smaller than 0.92 mils, I know that's outside of my max point, brain, my max point blank range, right? And then below that, you have your far zero, which that means with that 1.2 dialed on or holding it, uh, your point of aim, point of impact uh, for that hold is at 309 yards. It'll tell you all that stuff. So you can play with the target size. You can figure out, you know, how far out, what, what should I hold on this target size? And I can hold it dead center. And how far out will that take me without having to go and shoot it like we did today, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's kind of one of the hidden things. Again, it's under the zero range in your gun. So if we back out of that, uh, we have our bore height in inches. Um, you have your zero height, zero offset. Uh, these two say you zero your gun and then you put a suppressor on and you can, if you say you want to have two different gun profiles for your gun suppressed versus unsuppressed and you know the exact difference in point of aim shift or point of impact shift in between your gun suppressed and unsuppressed. You can build one gun with your with zero zero and your zero height, zero offset, right? And then you can build the other one and say, hey, I know with my suppressor on, it's a 0.5 mil shift down or, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. Then you can put uh, zero height uh, in inches. You can go um, uh, right or left. Obviously, if you go right, that means that it's going to hit high. And if you go down below zero and it gives you a negative number, that's low. So if I, if I, if it's going to hit, if I know that this gun in this profile is going to hit is essentially zeroed at, um, this is one's in inches, but you can change it over to mills if you just click on it. Right. Um, let me change this back here. If I know it's going to hit half a mil down, from my, where my zero is, you go in here, zero height, just put it half a mil down. Do the same thing with windage, right? All right, down below that, you have your rifle twist. Uh, if you click on that, you can change it between a right and a left hand twist. Most, most barrels are right hand twist, right? Um, in inches, and then this is where you can, you, can, you can change what your twist is. And again, like I said, that number is, uh, so like, like this, what it has in here, it had one, one and 11 and a quarter. So I just changed it to one and 11. Uh, for every 11 inches in that barrel, that bullet is making one full revolution, right? Uh, so obviously the lower the number, if you have a one and eight twist, one and seven twist, like most of your five, five, six guns probably have, it only takes seven inches for it to make that one full revolution. So the lower the number, the faster the twist. Uh, down below this, you have E unit and W unit. That's your elevation unit and windage unit. So if you're shooting an MOA scope, you can switch this over to MOA um, and it'll give you those outputs in MOA. Then what's that? Yeah, so right below that, uh, you have Cal DSF. So what Cal DSF is, is it's essentially truing your gun in the subsonic range. So you're doing the exact same thing, except that now it wants you to start at Mach 0.9. So remember when we, when we talked about kind of the difference in Mach's levels, Mach 1 being the speed of sound, Mach 1.2 being that lead edge of transonic, Mach 0.8 is like really when it's fully in subsonic, uh, it's going to spit out a distance for what would be not Mach 0.9 there. And you essentially just do, this, do the, same diff the same thing that you would when you're chewing your gun. <clears throat> With uh, Cal DSF though, you can only put in five points. Um, you can only put in five points here. Um, when you put in points in your DSF, so say I shoot my gun, it tells me to shoot it at a thousand yards, right? And I take it out and the only target that I have is at 1500 yards, right? And I go and I Cal DSF my gun at 1500. And then I go to another range the other day, like, oh cool, this one's got a thousand, so I can DSF it here. As soon as you put a point in, you can't put any nearer points in. You have to start near and you have to, and work far from there. So your first point, ideally you want it to be as close to that number as you can. And then the following points have to be, have to be further than that. Yeah. Yeah. So what this so it's is still taking all those individual points in. Yes. It's okay. so it's it's just tweaking that graph scale, right? Yeah, yeah. Or that or that, that trajectory or, or drag model, if you will. Um, 
so we trued our supersonic, right? So this is a supersonic stage of flight. So everything here is good. Whenever we go to DSF and we're calibrating our drop scale factor or our subsonic uh, stage of flight, whenever you do that, it's only tweaking and putting in those data points for the back half for the subsonic. It's not going to mess with anything in supersonic because we know that's good, right? It's only doing that back half. Um, below that, you can, uh, whoops, I backed out of everything. Below that, you can view DSF. Uh, you can you can go and, and see all your points. Yep, and if you scroll to the bottom, you can you can clear your DSF. Right below that, if you don't want that gun anymore, you can delete that gun. All right, so we'll back out of that. All right, so right below gun, we have environment. Uh, so right here on the main screen, it tells you the temperature, uh, and it says lock. You can switch between lock and live. Like I said yesterday, when it's on lock, the Kestrel is not taking in any of the environment, right? Whenever you switch it to live, uh, now all of the sensors on here are taking in, you know, the barometric pressure and the temperature and humidity, all that stuff, right? Um, again, when you do it on live, I wouldn't have your hand wrapped around this thing because these sensors on the back are going to pick up, you know, the the heat uh, and the and and all the kind of temperatures and stuff of, of yourself and not, not ambient temperature is what you want. So typically, I want to flip this to live. I keep these lanyards on here, one, so it doesn't fall off of me, uh, and two, so you can kind of spin it around. You don't even have to spin it around. Literally just let, let the, the kind of airflow pass across all the sensors right there. Um, do that, you know, for 10, 20 seconds and then flip it back to, back to lock. And like I said, the reason that we flip it back to lock um, is say we get to the range at the beginning of the day, um, we flip it to live, we gather our environmentals, it's in the morning, it's chilly, um, we flip it back to lock, so if I put this in my pocket or something, it's not on live and it's reading you know, the inside of my pocket uh, environment instead of the actual environment. Um, and then the, kind of that good rule of thumb is like, you know, whenever you have, it starts to heat up throughout the day and you wanna take your jacket off, you know, you, it's probably a good idea. You should probably update your environmentals. Or like whenever you feel a significant temperature or, or difference in the weather, um, if there's rain starting to come in, and, and you know you can kind of kind of feel that a little bit because that that pressure is dropping, like we talked about when Jay showed uh, in the slideshow yesterday, and and, and kind of when when rain happens, the pressure drops. Um, that that would also be a good time. Anything in the environment changes, update the environmentals. Uh, so if you click on environment. Uh, again, you can go lock or live uh, from the inside. Latitude, um, you can go ahead and put that in. Again, what is that, what is that for? Yep, for Coriolis. It's, it's telling the Kestrel in what hemisphere you're in, right? So it, so it knows based on that and your direction of fire to, to, to calculate in and, and account for Coriolis if, if you need to, again. Uh, so latitude right here. In Dalton, New Hampshire, we are at 44 degrees. Uh, so if you want to manually input that, um, right below, uh, right below that, you have your temperature. Uh, right below that, you have your station pressure uh, in inches of mercury, uh, relative humidity, uh, and then right below that, you have density altitude, which is a combination of those three things into into one number that you can use. Uh, and again, any of these things you can go in here and manually change. So if you want to make DA cards like we were talking about earlier, you can go in and manually change these till you have you know zero feet, 2,500 feet, 5,000 feet. And you, you can make those DA cards just off of changing this stuff and then going back to uh, your range card and figuring that stuff out. Right below that we have spin drift. You can turn that on or off. Um, aerodynamic jump, you can turn that on or off. Uh, wind capture, you can put this to win one target or all targets. So if you, you set all of your, all of your different targets, uh, like I was saying earlier in the, in the main ballistic screen, you can set multiple different targets. Uh, you can set your wind capture to where if you, click, if you put it on all targets, whenever you capture it, it's going to apply that wind direction and wind speed to every target that you have built. Or you can put it to one target um, so that for each specific target, you're going to have to capture the wind. Obviously, if you're shooting different directions of fire or the wind changes for, for any of those things, um, uh, one target is normally pretty good. So if we back out of that, uh, this is... Um, the range card right below that. So on range card, uh, obviously on the left side, you have your range. 
Uh, next to that, you have your elevation, uh, and it goes down to the hundredth place. And again, can we hold for hundredths in our mills? Nope. So uh, take those and, and round them to the nearest tenth, right? So for, for this one, 0.37, I'm just going to round that to 0.4. If I go down to here to another one, 1.23, I'm going to hold 1.2. You know, 1.15, I'm going to hold 1.2. You're just rounding it to, to the nearest tenth. Um, as you can tell, if I scroll up or down here, uh, obviously it changes the uh, my kind of distance. I can see if I if I select enter, I can uh, if you click the enter button on here, you can change the increments 10, 20, 25, 50, and 100. Uh, and right down here under scroll, this is kind of one of the neat things. I think earlier this year, uh, Kestrel put in an update so you can scroll between page or line. It used to be only line, so when you're when you're here and you're scrolling through. I'm on 100 right now, so it doesn't really matter. But when you're scrolling through, as you can see, there's 530 right here. When I click down, I just see 540. So you'd have to click. Like if I want to go from 570 to 800, I'd have to click and click and click a whole bunch of times till I get to 800, right? But if I go down here and squ switch it to page, it's going to go the whole next page down. So I have 820 at the bottom, now 830 at the top through 860. 873, yeah, it just scrolls through the page. It makes it a little bit faster. All right, in this right column, there's a couple different things that you can switch through using the left or right buttons. Uh, the first one is going to be wind one. So again, you have wind speed one, wind speed two, just like you, it's kind of common occurrences here. Whatever wind speed and direction you have put in, this is what it puts for your, for your range card. Uh, you have wind one there, wind two there. So as you scroll through for all these different, uh, different distances, it's going to tell you for, for that value and that mile an hour, this is what you should hold for wind. For the given distance that you're on in your in your range card, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you scroll to the right of that, you have lead. Um, so what this is is when we remember when we were in target speed uh, for the mile an hour that you have put in there. That's your mill lead for that for that mover, right? If you scroll to the right of that, you have trace. Uh, so this is kind of a, a neat little thing for you can use it for obstacle clearance. Uh, or you can use it to, to even to teach new shooters to, to watch and see that trace. Uh, so what this is, is in mills uh, from light of sight, line of sight from the shooter, in mills, how high that max order that trace is going to be, uh, which, is, which is pretty neat. Um, so you can see here, if I scroll down, like we were shooting today, 600. My trace is going to be 2.4 mils above the center of that target for with me holding the correct data, obviously, on that on that target there. So that's kind of a neat little feature. If you scroll to the right of that, you have REM-V, which is your remaining velocity at each distance, how fast your bullet's going. Uh, right below, right next to that, you have REM-E, which is your remaining energy in foot-pounds uh, at each distance. Uh, to the right of that, you have your time of flight. Right of that, you have spin drift, um, how much your bullet is drifting due to that uh, kind of centrifugal spin uh, at distance. So you can tell for this gun, at 800.19 mils of spin, so about 0.2, a little less than a minute, right? Um, the faster twist rate you get in your barrel, the more more spin drift you're going to have. So, like if you're 308 to one and eight, like at 800, you're probably looking at about 0.36 to 0.38 mils of spin drift. So just shy of 0.4 mils, which is significant. You know, that's that's something you absolutely have to count for. Um, all right, to the right of spin drift, you have H Coriolis, horizontal Coriolis, since it's, um, it's saying that based off of, obviously, the latitude that we put in there and our direction of fire. And as you can tell, if I go out to even 1,000 here, my, H, H, my horizontal Coriolis is only 0 0.08, not even a tenth of a mil. It's not, not really something you need to worry about until you get out to those, those, those real, real further distances. To the right of that, you have aerodynamic jump. So um, I, I think I talked about this a little bit yesterday based on crosswinds at about the first 30-ish meters of, uh, of, of the bullet meet, making contact with a crosswind. Um, for most guns, it's right around eight mile an hour of crosswind will we'll make, um, make that bullet jump up or down depending on if it's coming from the right or the left. If it's coming from the right, that bullet's gonna jump up a tenth for every eight mile an hour, again, that eight mile an hour, based on your bases on your twist, your bullet weight, all that, all that, uh, all that good stuff, your velocity. Um, 
And if it's coming from the rest from the left, it's going to bump that down. So eight mile an hour, meaning sixteen mile an hour, it's going to bump at point two, so on and so forth, right? Uh, and then you're back to wind speed one. So that's really the range card right there. Everybody good with that? Yeah. All right, right below range card, we have target card. So there's a ton of a ton of kind of cool cool things you can do in target card. So when I click on target card uh, for those first ten targets. Uh, that I made if I if I activated all of them and I made different targets This is where you can pull up and you can just see essentially in range card form uh, each each target um, There and you, again this right column is all the same stuff wind to wind speed It's all the same spot in the the same stuff as your as your range card, right? If I click enter here uh, And I scroll up to sector if I click on sector here uh, Or if I scroll to the right you can, you can input new sectors. So each sector, you can have up to 10 targets. I forget how many sectors you can have, but you can have a ton. So you can have a ton of different range cards uh, for different places. And so in each sector, um, you can rename the sector. Um, and then in the, in the sector, you can go and you can select the target inputs. And again, you can, you can uh, capture all the targets direction of fire, or you can go target each target individually and capture each one's direction of fire. And each target here, like these, these screens keep diving deeper and deeper and deeper. So each target here, I can click on it and it brings me to like essentially that main screen when I click on target. So you, fit, so you, you set all the info for that target uh, and then you can go down to the next one. And then when you back out of that, you can go to the next set of sector and make a whole 10 new targets with all of their specific info for that target, um, right? Wind inputs for each target. You can get wind inputs for all of them. And uh, again, this is where, um, where we were earlier. You can put um, all target wind capture uh, right here at the top. You can capture it and it'll just apply it to all the targets. Or you can go down uh, and capture or manually input um, each, each wind. So this is like where you would pre-plan all your stages of a match. Exactly. If you get a matchbook the day before, you can put in all, you, you can do 10 different sectors for each stage. This stage, it has four targets. These are my direction of fire, this, and then like when you get there, really all you gotta do is input the wind, and then you're good to go. Go to the next stage, next sector, right? Everything's already pre-planned out. So when you're in between, people are asking you to hop on the spot and scope and spot. Can you run the tablet? Can you call hits? You know, all this stuff. Um, the, you, you, all this stuff is already taken care of. You know, but you know, you're not back there plugging in everything for the next next stage, scrambling on your Kestrel to do that, um, which which is which, it's pretty helpful. Yep. Yep. And so if you scroll down, you can clear clear that sector. You can change the designators from uh, numerical to alphabetical. You can manage the sectors just like you can manage guns. And I'll get get into that. That's really the last screen we'll go into. Uh, you can see all of your different sectors and turn some on and turn some off if you don't if you don't want all of them there. Uh, so that's the target card. Those those screens will keep deep diving and deep diving. So you can put in so much info for so many different different targets under that, which is pretty neat. Uh, right below this is actually first. Uh, so actually first has some has some pretty cool um, little things for for rapid target engagement, all this all this type of stuff. So quick win. Remember what we talked about yesterday in that uh, that kind of quick win chart, uh, and we talked about your gun number. Your gun number being the rough math and the easy way to get it is that first decimal of the G1 BC of your bullet, right? And that that's your gun number that you use. The actual kind of more scientific way to do that, uh, an easier way to do that, especially if you have a Kestrel or even in, in uh, the geoballistics or whatever, whatever you're using, um, uh, you would set, you go to your range card, right? Or you go to your wind and you'd bump the wind up to whatever mile an hour you think it's gonna be and then you go to your range card and you go to wind one in here or wind, wind speed two, whichever one you want to set that mile an hour to, and you go down to 500 yards and you keep playing with that wind until it matches out to exactly a 0.5 hold. Everybody see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so then, it, then it'll, you, you're changing that wind until the whole chart and all the numbers line up exactly how you told you there, and then that's your gun number, is that wind speed. That's kind of the actual, the, I guess the, the way to do it through running the actual data and numbers instead of just using that G1BC because in some bullets that's it's skewed like that like 
for that 77 green, uh, Mark 262. Um, well, that, well, that stuff's actually actually pretty close. But for, for other things, um, especially when you when you get up into some of the higher calibers, it, it, it can be skewed a little bit. So a cool thing about actually first setting, though, is that you can just forget everything I just told you. Because uh, if you click on Quick Wind uh, and you go down and hit Calculate, my gun is a 4.1 mile an hour gun. And it just gives you your gun number exactly to the tenth of the mile an hour there, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, I just ran that to four, exactly. Right below that, you have wind dot. So all of you guys are running Tremor 3s uh, right here. That's going to tell you uh, for every wind dot for this gun that I have selected right now, every wind dot is worth three mile an hour, 2.9, round it to three. So each one of those, yep, you can use your wind brackets like that. Um, in that tremor reticle. Uh, right below that we have speed drop. Um, who has not heard of speed drop? Everybody's heard of speed drop? You guys all heard that? So essentially this gives you, it's a little cheat sheet for your speed drop. So you go down and hit calculate there. It's going to say my speed drop number is 2.2. .2. So I'm going to go on my, on my scope. You can subtract 2.2 .2 from the distance if you want. Or the easy way that I've found it, if you're going to use speed drop, um, dial down 2 point, not up, dial down 2.2 .2 on your scope. And now for this gun, this is your range min and range max that this works in. From 278 yards to 743 yards, your reticle's a BDC. So if it's 300 yards, you hold three. If it's 540 yards, you hold 5.4, so on and so forth. But it only works from 278 to 743, right? Um, so that, yeah, that's uh, along with speed drop, if you click on it, and you click on it again, right there, there's the error. Uh, it'll say plus or minus 0.2. You can only change it down to 0.1, like you see here, uh, 0.1 or 0.2. If you change it down to 0.1, it's going to shrink those ranges. That's going to work ever so slightly, take a little bit off of each end, right? Um, and so what that's doing is saying, with this number dialed on, if I hold three mils for 300, that three mil hold at 300 is going to be within 0.1 or 0.2, whichever one you have it set of, on, of your actual no shit hold. So it could be 0.2 off, but you're willing to accept the error of 0.2, and if you're not, you can bump it down to 0.1. Yeah. Um, back out of that, you can go down, this is uh, AJ aerodynamic jump like I was talking about. AJ equals 0.1 mil at what wind speed? Uh, hit calculate, so for this gun, like I said, eight mile an hour, it normally works out to, to eight mile an hour there. If you get into a little bit heavier bullets with faster twist rates, like a 308 takes 175 grain Sierra Match King and you drop it down to like an 8 twist. Uh, a lot of like Mark 22's MRADs, if you guys have seen those, those, those 308 barrels on those are 8 twists. Uh, keeps that bullet a little bit more stable through transonic. Um, those AJ, uh, with that faster twist rate, AJ is going to have a little bit more of a significant effect on it. So it's going to be take about every five mile an hour is going to jump that, that gun, that, uh, that bullet point one up or down. All right, so moving down next uh, onto ballistics. So if you click on ballistics, again, this range, you can change this range in here, um, but it's going to auto populate to whatever range you have, have set on the target that's, that's up uh, on your main, main ballistics screen right there. So if you go down, you have, it's kind of all of the deep dive data and science uh, and, and tells you all the info you'd want to know about the trajectory of your bullet and what it's doing at that range. So you have your range there, you have your elevation, what your hold is, wind speed one, wind speed two holds. Uh, R trans, so this is uh, at what distance your bullet goes transonic, right? Uh, R subs, this shows you what distance your bullet goes subsonic. Uh, max O, which is your max ordinate in, in, in inches, which is the highest point of that bullet's trajectory throughout its flight, flight path. Uh, aerodynamic jump, uh, vertical Coriolis, horizontal Coriolis, spin drift, uh, trace, like we said earlier, uh, your drop in inches, if you wanted to know that, your lead for the target speed you have put in there at time of flight, your remaining velocity, your remaining energy. Uh, so it shows you kind of all these, all these different uh, things about the, the, the target range that you have inputted into there, um, which is pretty neat. So right below that, you have manage guns. So right here, you'll have all the guns that you have, that you have built uh, in your Kestrel. Um, and you can also scroll down and hit new gun here. Right here, 
where you can see uh, it has on, you can turn guns on or turn them off. Uh, if you turn them off, if you scroll up um, in the main ballistic screen and you have, have it highlighted over gun, remember how I say you can go right or left to switch between your guns. If the gun's off, it won't appear there. So if you wanna, this is honestly something that I use in matches to make sure that I don't mess anything up. So you know, I, I have a lot of guns built in here, not in this specific one, but in that one I have, I have a ton of guns built in that one. Um, the guns that I'm not using for that match, I'll turn them all off. So I don't ever accidentally bump it, bump it over. I, I've done it multiple times and I want you guys to not do that. Um, bump it over and then you're like, man, why am I, why am I holding freaking 30 mils at, at 600 or at, or at 400 or something? It's like, because oh, you bumped it over to your 22, you know? Um, and then at the bottom of that, you can hit delete all if you want to delete all your guns and you want to quit long range. All right, there you go. That is the Kestrel Masterclass. That was a lot of information in a very short amount of time. As you can see, it is a very feature-packed tool, something that you can use, utilize for a lot of different things, and you can use this tool for all your different guns. Now, if you're interested in getting one, if you saw all that and you go, okay, cool, I want one, I'm sold, uh, I will leave a link down in the comments and a coupon code, and it'll save you some money if you're in interested in getting one. Kestrel also makes a bunch of other really cool products. They have the Magneto, I think they're like partnered with Magneto Speed, so you can get a uh, Chrono, if you're interested in one of those, their shot timers are really nice, so a bunch of other stuff too, but yeah, but this thing's awesome. There are a couple other features in there that Larry didn't talk about, like the 12 inch drill in the accuracy first section. Um, for a variety of reasons, we're just not gonna talk about that here, but you can use your imagination and you can figure that out, or you can sign up for a Ridgeline class, and if you're interested in diving deeper into the features and being able to use them and knowing what the different things do. You can take a Ridgeline class with Larry and Jay and they will walk you through that. I think in their precision rifle, maybe their, uh, was, I think it's precision rifle. I don't know, I'll leave a link uh, down in the description to their class, but you can sign up for one of those. They did it um, at the SPR class. I don't know they have enough time to include that in the two day version. We only did it in the five day because we were there and some of us opted to stay late to learn some of that. Um, I will also leave a link for Larry down below and Jay as well and Ridgeline so you guys can follow all of them. But again, if you're interested in more information on that, go sign up for a class with them. They will walk you through everything more in depth and help you get set up if that's something that you wanna do. Uh, if you have questions specifically about the Kestrel that I can answer for you in a future video, let me know because I've got the video coming up pairing this with the SIG binos and uh, using some of the things that he talked about in there and showing you guys how I utilize that. Uh, but again, if you have questions for that, leave them in the comments down below. Make sure that you guys hit that like and subscribe, karate chop that bell so you get notified every time I upload a video and I will see you guys in the next one. So everybody on the internet saw your video, they saw your restaurant, and then look, look. Let's go, there's so many, look. Thumbs up. Can you see what it says? It said, hi James, and there's more hi James. This hi James, nice restaurant. They like, <laughs> they like your restaurant, look, let's see. Everyone like their restaurant. Look at, look, it says awesome James. Said, awesome restaurant. Yeah. He's like got the Minecraft Lego set. He's going to come over. What the? Yeah. Minecraft Lego set. You want to answer all of them? I want to. There's lots of them. And let me tell a joke. Okay, tell the joke. What's your knock, joke? Knock, knock. Who's there? Joe. Joe who? Joe mama. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Joke. Yeah, they'll see your video joke. Hey, tell them thank you. Tell them thank you for, for all the comments. Thank you for all the comments! Okay, all right, bye-bye.